So this is uh, Ralph Johnson. We're talking about refactoring, and uh, this is in Portland, Oregon, at the home of uh, Ward. Hi. And uh, Ralph, tell us, what, what is refactoring? So refactoring is changing the structure of a program without changing its behavior. So the whole point is that um, the design has, is out of shape. You know, it's not designed the way you want it to be. So sometimes there's too much duplication. Um, sometimes uh, you've changed the code, and so it's hard to figure out what it means, and you just want to make it easier to understand. And sometimes you're trying to make it be more reusable. You want to pull out some uh, module and to be some separate reusable component. I mean, it can mean there's lots of different purposes for it, but the idea is that you're changing the design of the code, but you're basically changing, you're, you're, you want the feature to say, so fixing a bug or adding a feature is different. And that's actually one of the keys, is that when you know how to separate between the two, usually when you're, you're making some changes to code, you're doing some of both. You're both trying to improve the structure and you're trying to fix a bug or add a feature. But if you can separate them and do one and then do the other, you, you can actually do it faster. That's you, sort of the key idea behind refactoring. Can you tell us the history of refactoring and all, or what, where did it well, come from? So the um, people have been doing refactoring since they've been programming. And, but the, the term, I actually learned the term, I think, uh, at Tektronix so with, with Ward and Kent. <laughs> we use the term, and, and I can't quite remember where we learned it, but I think it might have been, you know, just casually used in conversation yeah, with, but that with was, that small was, talk that, that people was, from Xerox. That was in the 80s, and then in 89, I wrote a paper um, with uh, Bill Updike that used the name. And so I think that was the first time the word it was, was published. The yes. word was published, but right. we didn't make it. I mean, I'm pretty sure we learned it at Tektronix. Yeah, and and I think that it came out of object-oriented programming, yep. where where there was a sense that the code should should have a certain uh, readability. Yeah. You know, just as a mathematician, when he multiplies mm -hmm. out some expression, might collect <laughs> terms or rearrange it for readability. And, mm -hmm. and he's doing that in a way that won't change the formula, but, but, yeah. but makes it easier to understand what's going on. But I got involved in it because I was interested in framework design and making reusable software. And one of the things I learned, and I learned this partly by watching other people, it was people at Tektronix and people at the Xerox, was that you know, it was sort of hard to make something reusable. You had to rewrite it three, four, five times, and you kept reusing it. And every time you'd reuse it, you'd sort of figure out a little bit better how to make it. Yeah. And so there's that whole process. So we started building frameworks and seeing the exact same thing that happened, whether we were doing them in C++ or, or, um, or Smalltalk. And you know, now people do it in Java and Ruby and so on. It's sort of the same thing. It's, it's harder to make something reusable than you think. And this refactoring <coughs> is actually a key part of of making the design right. Well, uh, but, but, well, when, so, but one of the big things that happened was Kent Beck uh, came up with this uh, extreme programming. So extreme programming is a way of, of making software, and, to, and one of his key practices was refactoring. So he said refactoring was something you did all the time. It wasn't just for making software more reusable, but it was just making your software better. And so it was a, a part of that. And then... And, um, and, and one of the keys is don't wait until you got a big mess. Yeah, you should. You know, you, 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 you implement some little feature, and then you, you take a look at it, and, and you read the code, that feature in the context of all the other code you've written. And if it fit in really nice, you know, you're lucky. It's sweet. But if it didn't fit in, it's a little awkward, and you kind of wish this other code was a different way, well, make it another way. Make the code... Once you make it work, then make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and that's a, that's a doable thing if you do it, you know, every it, half it's, an it's, hour. It's, it's not a big deal. Right? <clears throat> if you do it regularly, it's how you keep your code in good shape, and it's not a big deal. But what happens is, when you have a big project, you get a lot of people who come in who don't really know how the system is supposed to work, and they... They need to add a feature, and it's a little difficult, and they do lots of copy and paste, and you get layer upon layer of patch over time. The software gets, uh, you, know, you know, you get you get a lot of unnecessary uh, software, hard to understand, and it's it's usually because of, <coughs> of people who aren't that familiar with the code, and so they're afraid to to right, fix it. Right. Sometimes, so, so sometimes the management doesn't want them to fix it. Management right. will say, don't touch anything that works because you might break something which which is true you might break right, it right right the, the saying if it isn't if it isn't broken don't, don't fix, fix it, it. Yeah. well 
But I think at some point you have to say, look, if nobody can understand it, it's broken. It's broken. Yeah. And it needs to be fixed. And yep. sometimes that's a, some of the most difficult software to fix. But, you know, you just get in there and it's like spelunking in a cave and you find something and you connect this and whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's turned into an art form, mm -hmm. you know, which, which is, uh, you know, taking something that works or mostly works and finding kind of in it what people were thinking. Now, what you really want is, is while you're thinking, you just want to say, okay, now that we got that working, let's make it easy to see what we were thinking. And, and who would have thought you could read code? Well, I think you can read code, and if you can read, you should do if you can code. read the code and say, I can tell they were thinking, what they were thinking. And here's the best <laughs> part about it. If you can read code and you can say, I can tell they weren't thinking about this. You, you know, the, the, you know, right, the feature that you want to add, I can look at the code and I can tell they weren't thinking about it, and you say, oh, it's like having a blank slate. I can go do what I want. Now, what, what you hate is when you say, oh, I just looked at the code and I could see that they were thinking about this, but they didn't finish. Right, they left some kind of half-coded thing in there because they thought, well, I got half of it done, I don't want to erase it. Well, a lot of, a lot of refactoring is finding that code that doesn't need to be there for what you're doing right now. <coughs> Even if you think you'll use it tomorrow, you can write it tomorrow faster than you can figure out what you left today to use tomorrow. And that that is, you know, well, I, I talk to people about this and I say, you know, we, we talk about how good it is to work in an extreme programming environment. And they say, well, what you talk about is crazy. And I say, but don't forget, the code is always clean. You know, you, the, you, it is such a pleasure to work on clean code. And the way it's always clean is every time you make a change, you go back and you say, is it still clean? If not, you refactor. Okay, design, def, er, define clean, and you use the word beauty. Mm -hmm. what, what are you talking about? What does that mean? What, what, what's, what's clean mean to you, Ralph? Part of it is, is understandability, being able to read it and mm -hmm. see what it's doing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that there's enough structure in the code that you, you know, and, and, and we're talking about experienced programmers. Somebody looks at it is used to seeing clean code and they say, yeah, this is clean code. It, so, it, it, it is it is somewhat subjective. There's a certain style and you learn the style. And, uh, you know, there have been several times I've had to learn a pretty radically different language. And in the beginning, you know, it all looks crazy and it's only after you work on it for a while and then you start to make sense of it and have you're, a you're, you're talking about, about style. Days or weeks or months it, it, or years? It's, it's, or it's, it's, it's probably weeks. Yeah, weeks. So when you're an experienced uh, programmer to learn something new. And, and so, so what I think clean means is when you're going to look at a piece of code and you know that code does X, and you look at it and you see here's code that is pretty much what you would have expected. You know, you had some ideas of what would be there and you go look and that's what you find. And <clears throat> what a relief. And in fact, if there's a little something out of place, then you look at it and you say, why is this out of place? Oh, here's one more thing I didn't know. This needs to be out of place because I just learned something by reading the code. Mm -hmm. that's, that's clean code, where, where what it says is what you need to know. But, but a lot of that is a convention, that you know, sure. the, you know the conventions of the, of the system. Yes. Right. It's, it's like, well, the, the, it's, it's a language. Mm -hmm. And... You know, you know, language is very, I think we, we fell in love with this concept working in small talk, where it came out of this very small community, and the conventions had been... Pretty consistent. Consistent. Yeah. So, you know, anybody who wrote small talk wrote small talk in the way, in, in pretty much the same way. Yeah. Now, if you, if you look at some other languages, like, uh, you know, I think C well, and C++, you know, if you're looking at embedded, there's one set of conventions. If you're looking at Windows program, there's yeah. another set yeah. of well, conventions. Well, I, I learned, it, I learned it with Unix, and there was, there were people who violated it, but, you know, there was a fairly consistent Unix style yes. with C. Yeah, and then, the Kerning and Enrichie style. Yeah, and right, when I, ever I, I look at Windows stuff, you know, it's, it's just, it's just really different. And yeah, it yeah, sort of makes my head hurt. But, but I'm it, sure, <laughs> if I, if I did it for a whole summer, you know, I could, I'd get over it, and I would learn, because people who do it, uh, can like it, but you know I haven't done it long enough. Well, and and, and that's and so so in those the same language, different problem space. Mm -hmm. The definition of clean is, is different, different in those right. two spaces. Yeah. But but again, if somebody who's experienced in working in that environment 
looks at that code, if it's what they expect, then I think you can call it clean. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it's, it's all a matter of the readability of the code. Well, Vista is different. Uh, Vista is an integration between language and data. So we did not make the distinction in designing Vista between language and data that most languages do. So it's closer to Lisp than, say, COBOL or Fortran. Sure. So there isn't a data division and a procedure division. So the split between data and program doesn't exist in Vista. And when I did the first uh, design of Vista, I, I created this very tiny kernel of 19 <coughs> commands and 22 functions in one data type. The data type was partially local, partially global. The structures were no SQL structure, which today is fashionable at the time it was radical. But it was a very high dimensionality space, if you will. It's very sparse arrays. And uh, about 50 to 80 percent of Vista is the null string. So we have names of things that don't exist. And so all the, all the information is in the names of stuff. So we played all kinds of games between uh, blending data and program and, and remerging them into uh, a single semantic domain. So this semantics between data and program that we merged together gave us this cat-like quality to Vista that everybody says, oh, it's impossible to, to deal with. Well, I'd like to slide a little closer. Okay. So this is an important conversation. I am sure uh, when you have a system like that, yeah. that there are lots of conventions. I would call them patterns. A lot of patterns in how people use it. Um, and that that becomes a really important part of of reading the code, understanding yeah, it, sure. and, and uh, because you know, small talk is the same way, and Lisp sure. is like yeah, that too. Yeah. They're, they're very fundamentally simple and powerful. But then people build layer upon layer upon layer upon them, yeah. and and the convention is is really important. One of the things that's interesting also about uh, I bet this is true of in fact I'm sure it's true of of this of the way you explain it, and is true of of um, small talk and Lisp as yeah. well, is that they're really, they're not languages, they're really systems. Sure, that, it's an environment. It's, it's an environment, it's a, exactly. It's a shell, I call it a linguistic shell. It's not yeah. like the seashell in uh, whatever, Bash or whatever. In but but the, it, the thing about these systems that, that, that makes them interesting that they have systems instead of languages is that uh, you know, so much depends on what's in the environment, and in this case, you're talking about all the data yeah. that, that is stored there. You can't just look at some small piece of code and say exactly what it means, because yeah. what it means is based on what <coughs> environment it's yeah. in. Yeah, and, and uh, I was creating that environment when I came but, to the VA. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw I, people that weren't talking to each other, so I was create, overcoming a failure to communicate. And I was very user-oriented. I, I mean, I, I had 50,000 users on this digital communication system. Uh, but the, the point is, is it was, it was a communications infrastructure mm -hmm. that happened to have a data structure uh, thing attached to it. And what I see happening is a, a decomposition of this, this very rich and linguistic environment into very specific APIs. So it's like you have this elephant that people are, the blind people are feeling the elephant, and I say, Oh, this this looks like an ear, so I'll I'll refactor the ear. Mm -hmm. But nobody is looking at the whole elephant, mm -hmm. and the, you know Vista has been dealing with the elephant for 34 years, and it's not a it's not a nice crisp entity. So to decompose the elephant into parts and then try to restitch them back together from the dissected elephant to the whole elephant is is uh, probably not going to work, in my opinion. And I, I think what, what I'd really like to explore is the possibility, instead of refactoring, which is going down a level, of recomposing, building new tools that allow us to build this new vision and pattern languages and patterns and executable patterns that say, okay, we need workflow, we need state management, we, we need clinical protocols. Sure, but and building a higher level rather than dropping down to a lower level. So I don't think refactoring is lower level. When people are making software be more reusable, they usually are trying to design higher levels. So, yeah. so for example, uh, you have something that is trying to um, do workflow. Well, you can go into the existing code. You can find lots of places that are doing workflow by hand, you know, just a lot yeah. of code to do that. And so you come up with a better way of doing it. So let's say we do. Let's yeah. say we come up with a better way of doing it. What are you going to do about all the old code? Are you just going to leave it there? Well, probably. 
probably you'll some of it you will just leave because yeah. nobody ever has to touch it. It works. It's good enough. Leave it alone. But there's other parts of the system that you want to make changes to. And you say, oh, if it were just done with a new workflow system, it would be so much easier to change. Yeah. So you're going to go in. You're going to rewrite that old system to use a new workflow system. Probably yeah. when you do that, the new system will get smaller. It'll get simpler, easier to understand because it's it, you, you've refactored out all that workflow stuff. Now, the question is uh, how... Yeah. So one of my research topics is building these automated tools for yeah. refactoring. And most of the work I do now is with <coughs> strongly typed languages because that's sure. what... But I started it all with Smalltalk. And Smalltalk sure. is dynamically typed. You, know, you don't get any of that information. So a lot of people now say, well, I, I can see how you do... Uh, um, in languages like Ruby and so on, sure. people talk about yeah. um, that. They say, well, but it's dynamically typed. How could you possibly make tools for it? But yeah. We made tools for small talk. You know, that is not sure. really, uh, again, it, whether, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't, I don't know for sure because I haven't looked enough at this uh, at yeah. to, to see that. But I would imagine that when you say, here is a new module that you want to rewrite, that there's, you know, you can look for certain things and, and understand the code and make, you know, and change things to yeah. be able to use the, the new module. And whether you have tools for it or not, if you come up with higher level ways of thinking, um, then you'll want to go back in and, and change the old code to use it, and that's refactoring. Well, I, yeah, I mean I, I mean, I don't know the current state of Vista, by the way. I haven't touched it in 10 years at least, but, and I'm sure there's a lot of spaghetti in there, and, and it's pretty all miserable. Big, all big systems have that. Yeah, just, and, and just, I started out with this incredibly tiny crystalline 19 commands and 22 functions and one data type and to me it was beautiful and it was a beautiful internal initial condition I don't think that one out of a thousand people understand what that was and it, it is part of this onion layer onion diagram the first layer outside of that was the metadata so I had a very tiny kernel interpreting metadata that became data that became the applications mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. and over time it became centralized and Washington took over and they started adding warts on the onion, I call it. So suddenly, out, outer layers of the shell started getting features that should have been internal, and it lost the, the charm of the internal beauty of this uh, crystalline structure and turned into a bowl of spaghetti. But, um, but whatever, but the, the point is, is that looking forward, um, to me it seems like we should be designing patterns of, of, of health and vitality and the good things that we're trying to do and from this higher level understanding then dropping down to building the tools so that we we're recomposing what we're trying to get to mm -hmm. rather than spending all of our energy digging down deeper and, and you know feeling the ears of the elephant and recomposing the elephant or refactoring the elephant and well, to me, I, I to me it's a, it, we need to go to a broader vision of what we're trying to get in a futuristic vision rather than a retro vision, which I see happening. So, so, so the way you say, I mean, clearly, uh, the bigger a system gets, the more high-level abstractions you need in order to deal with that to basically reduce the intellectual size. And you'll you'll see intellectual size. What's that? That means how hard it is to understand the whole the whole system. It, it's not. Yes, it may okay. not even be possible to understand it, but, but that's what yeah, you're trying to do. You're I can understand to... an elephant without understanding its metabolism. Sure, sure. So an elephant is an elephant, and yep. I can yep. stand back and look at it. So I yep. don't... You don't have to understand I it. don't need intellectual size to understand an elephant, right? No, that says that... The, the, uh, if... if that, that's what it means to be able to understand it, is that it's, you, its intellectual size is small enough for you to undersize it. Okay. So that's, that's a, it's, but, it's a measure of understanding. But is that one of the blind men feeling the elephant? You know, I mean, I, I feel an ear, so that's the, the elephant is this ear that I'm feeling. How do you understand the elephant as a whole? I don't know. Well, how do you? Oh, it's pretty obvious. I mean, you see the elephant, you stand back and you see the elephant, but if you start sitting there with the syringe and drawing blood samples and refactoring the blood samples and decomposing the elephant into one particular specific decompositional path, you, you can't understand the elephant anymore. I mean, if you to, try to dissect the elephant, you're never going to have to, the elephant again. Uh, well, so, so, so first of all, 
a particular elephant. It's certainly true. You start dissecting a particular elephant, it's dead, you're not going to do anything. Uh, people who have learned how to say treat elephant diseases yeah. will will dissect elephants as part of learning how to do that. It's a good and way they, to know and, it. And then yeah. they end up learning something about elephants, which adds to our knowledge yeah, and of, of understanding them. So, uh, if you think of the, the scientific, uh, how we learn things, <clears throat> the sort of decomposition, yeah. uh, there's a lot of things it doesn't teach us, but there are a lot of things it does teach us. It's a particular intellectual tool, a particular way of approaching problems, which yeah. has been fairly successful, although you know it's not been completely successful. It's been very successful in decompositional understanding of the system. Now, and again, I think of it with, with healthcare, you know, there's things like dealing with trauma that we're pretty good at. You know, the, the medical sure. system knows how to do that really well, whereas there's a lot of, of, uh, of long-term diseases. I think of this, you know, fatigue syndrome. Of obesity, obesity addiction. And, and, and you, we're just not very good at that. So there's, there's some yeah. things that we, we're good at, some things we're not good at, and I think this whole special specialist approach, the, the decomposition, which is, you know, part, it's a part of society and science, and, and medicine takes that too. You know, it works better at some things than others. That's, that's all, yeah. all I'm saying. Uh, it, it is not entirely bad, but it is not a complete view either. Now, but getting back to software, I don't think that, I mean, I think the way you're using refactoring is, is wrong. Refactoring simply means you're trying to change the software without changing, you're trying to change the structure of the software. And yeah. it, you're, you're doing what you think of as an improvement. Now, I, I think we're both referring to, the, I can't remember who did it, but they were converting the whole thing into, into Java, right? Yeah. Yeah. Into, and it was <laughs> ten times as big, and it didn't look like Java when it was done. Sure. It, you know, it didn't look like Mums. It didn't look like Java. It was a very interesting intellectual exercise. It's like, whoa, it's amazing somebody can do that. But would anyone actually want to program it? I don't know why anybody would want to program it. I can't imagine sure. anybody yeah. really would. And that's not a factor. I mean, you could say, well, if it, did, if it behaved exactly the same as it did before, by my definition... Uh, it it does the same thing. It's got the same. It's got a yeah. different structure and the same behavior. So it is a refactoring. But another part of refactoring is you think you're improving it. I mean, that's why you're doing it. You're trying to add something, yeah. and it may not be actually making it smaller. Often people will say that. You know, you're refactoring to make it simpler and smaller. Yeah. And maybe you're trying to make it be reusable. And <clears throat> making it reusable might make it smaller, or it might not. It might actually make it a bigger. But if it solves the what you consider the really important problem, and you think now the software is better because of what you've done, then, then you can say it was a, a refactoring. So, I think of a refactoring as, you know, so you say, suppose you you notice that there is some uh, missing abstraction, some idea like workflow. Sure. That say you know that that. Uh, Vista doesn't really support workflow. It's not a built-in way of doing that. Instead, it, you just look at module after module, or application after application, I guess that's what you'd call it, and you, you have workflow-like ideas in all sure. of them that's done differently in one and the other. If we could just come up with a higher-level way of doing that, we could, we could uh, simplify a lot of different projects, make it easier to go right. from project to project, and there'd be this one tool that we would use to do it every, everywhere. And maybe when you actually look at how people do... do uh, do workflow. There's some standard things you'd like to have, which sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It's just so inconsistent. And if you could do it right once, then everybody could use it. Uh, yeah. Life would be so much better. And well, that's the tool-based approach, and and that's it, where patterns would be so valuable. Yeah. To look at yeah. VA from the yeah. Vista but, from but, a pattern level, but, but, but I think, a higher I think, level I think, generativity. But see, not, that, not that's what I that's what I think of as as refactoring. I don't think that's what the VA thinks of it. It may not be. They're, I, they're I have no idea it. what the VA thinks of as refactoring. Oh, they're I, decompositional. I, I I don't know. But what I'm saying is that refactoring is about changing your software. And of course, why are you going to change it? You're changing it because you think you're going to make it better. Yeah. And it's about it's about a disciplined way of changing the software without breaking it. You know, you're trying not to change yeah. what it does. And and frequently it's because you've got a new way of doing things. Yeah. You, you you say here is how we ought to have designed it. And so now we're gonna we're gonna do this new way, and then we'll be consistent. We want to go through and change the whole system so that you don't have to think about. 15 different ways of doing it, but there can be well, this, this one way. But and, and 
and it could get used for, I mean, if you have bad designers and they're refactoring, they'll put bad design in, you know, so it's not, it's not guarantee of, of doing well. So and, how do you define good refactoring? Well, how, I, what's your I definition of goodness? What's a fit, fitness? If this is an evolutionary step in the software, yes. how do you define fitness? So, so it's really an issue of design. Is this a better design or not? And, which, okay. is a, which is a hard question. I mean, yeah. how, how do you know whether it's a, a better design? And I mean, you want to have experienced people who understand the real problems, and sometimes you make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you it's know a, this is a mistake? Because things get worse. <laughs> well, but, but the DOD made a mistake. They designed this thing called Alta, mm -hmm. which I, I saw the design and within two seconds decided that was a disaster. And they went ahead and did $4 billion worth of development. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, one of the it's federal government's great uh, disaster areas. It's one of the third leading cause of physicians leaving the federal government because uh, of the DOD. That's how bad the software is. That went on for, what, 10 years? Hmm. They just kind of grinding down and grinding down. So they're blaming the software, not their development methodology. But it's this uh, incredibly reductionistic functional decomposition of central office knows what's best. And there's this central definition, and it just decomposes. Yep. Yep. You, fa you fan it out to the uh, So that, that's sort of interesting, because you know that's the Soviet way of doing things. That's exactly Whereas what Washington when you, when, is doing. When you actually look at uh, the U.S. military... You know, it's always the one of the strengths of the U.S. military has been giving authority to the individual officer, and you know, even a, a lieutenant when he's out in the field, he's supposed to know the right thing to do, and if he's given a command that's clearly the wrong thing to do, he shouldn't follow the command. He should do the right thing. So that's that is a, you know the official U.S. military doctrine. It didn't and it's happen funny, in software. And it's funny that they try to treat software differently. No, no, it's entirely <laughs> different. And uh, I, but I, it's just this overwhelming I, decompositional model. There is no sense of composition of patterns of generativity mm -hmm. of, of climbing up the ladder of abstraction mm -hmm. everything is downward mm -hmm. and that's that's the, the what I see is so gruesome about all this mm -hmm. is there's just this in, incredible crunch to go downward dissect the elephant refactor the uh, left toenail of the elephant and we're going to re reconstruct the elephant and the the ability to go up a ladder and look at a higher level of abstraction say so what are we really trying to accomplish in health mm -hmm. And one of the other issues that, that, you know, you're a computer scientist, and I respect that, and that's probably my home discipline, if you will, but we're also talking about organizational redesign, of, of how we treat health, and in the development of Vista, it was always a very direct user interface system. So if I put in new software in Vista, and it didn't work, the next morning at coffee in the hot cafeteria, I'd get on it. You know, people mm -hmm. would tell me, mm -hmm. I'd call them that afternoon and be fixed. Mm -hmm. So there was this incredible tight feedback loop between mm -hmm. the users and development. Mm -hmm. And 50,000 people online and all this kind of stuff. So it was this entire ecosystem of, of users and physicians and docs. And Ward, you and I were talking about the prevalence of 172 hospitals. There's one doc or one physician or one pharmacist or whatever per discipline. That has that spark and the creative energy to to go after it. This would be I'm I'm the father of this this entity mm -hmm. or mother. Well, father is usually the metaphor. <laughs> but the the point is is that there's somebody out there that that has the end user responsibility that knows what it's like to mm -hmm. apply this technology in their context mm -hmm. that can feed it back, and that's a really powerful thing. Is, is that a, is that a situation where refactoring? Is important, or is that something that's other than refactoring? That, that's different from refactoring. So this is is actually another thing about extreme programming. So extreme programming had this is again, Kent Beck and Kent and Ward were a, a pair for a long time, um, and when Kent said so, extreme programming is a you know a way of developing software, and uh, Kent wrote books about it, and and he actually says he was trying to. Uh, formalize or trying to systematize, try to write rules for what he and Ward would do all the time. And w one of his rules is, um, I don't know even what he calls it, but it's, it's uh, having the on-site customer. It's having a customer as part of the team. And so it's really working really, really closely. Yeah. And, and their uh, point is that the customer can't be someone in, even in another building. It sure. needs to be maybe in the in the in the office next to you. It's got to be somebody you talk to multiple times a day. Yeah. And that 
because frequently when you're programming, if you're not an expert in the domain, you'll run into situations where you're not sure what to do. And what sure. most programmers do is they just say, well, I bet this is logical. Sure. This is probably what we should do. Because it's too hard to actually talk to someone who knows the right answer. Right. Or and if they can't figure out which way to do it, they do it both ways. Yeah. And yeah, make I it a user it. switch, and that way they can't be accused of not doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. They, what they really did is they pushed their question on to the, program, to the end user. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, being able to work really closely with users is, is I think, a, a key part. In, I mean, lots of other projects have said it's a really a key sure. part of success. And uh, it has nothing to do with refactoring. It but, just is a key but, part of success. But, but, but most people who use systems cannot understand the system by reading a document that describes it. Most yeah. people you know, will know it when they see it. And they'll know they haven't got it when they don't see it. Yeah. And so you put something in front of somebody and they use it, you know, an hour. And they'll say, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And then they can tell you. Only then can they tell you what's bothering sure. them about it. And if you can listen, and if you're not too tied to the code you wrote, if you work too hard on the code, you'll say, I don't care. That's what I gave you. Yeah. But if you're not too tied to it, like, if you can just change it to what they happen to be saying now, then you yeah. fo you follow them. And, and then, of course, most people say, well, if you do that, the code gets out of control. It stops being nice code. And, and that's where refactoring comes from. You say you, 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 you add a new feature, you respond to a user, and then you say, oh, what do we have to do now to make it look like we knew this all along? But what if you build tools that allow them to do that the first time around? Like you give them a spreadsheet and macros to customize a spreadsheet. So if they want to see this column sorted a different way and pivot table here and everything, you give them the tools, they have to learn how pivot tables work, but they can adapt that themselves. So they're no longer dependent on the the code to do what they want to do. You give them a flexible, mm -hmm. we call it a programmerless uh, toolkit. And uh, we spend our time programming ourselves out of the, the loop. But what if you give them the, this this toolkit approach, and that's why I like to call it recomposing rather than refactoring mm -hmm. and climbing up a level and what are the upper levels what what's the meta level above the, the the current level and one of my problems with the current refactoring effort is it's kind of a, a, a back to what Vista was in 1995 so it's it's a backwards compatibility thing and and it, it has no what, so, so how is it different in 95 from and I thought that actually it hadn't improved a lot since 95. Yeah, it, 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 it went, well, it went to central office, and central office took over instead of the field. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the, the end user feedback, and they quit developing these end user tools. Okay. So they weren't putting out a spreadsheet with macros. They were putting out mega programs with... Uh, so what are some of the kind of end user tools that were uh, in Vista well, back in the day? Well, the meta, metadata, for, for one thing. Everything um, was done through metadata. You programmed it once there, and then if you did it for pharmacy or laboratory or radiology, it was just different uses of the, the report writer or the data entry tool. Okay, so uh, report writer were things that, uh, that non-programmers could, yeah. could do. So if you wanted to look for brittle diabetics in the database and see their lab results and their prescriptions, mm -hmm. you could write a, uh, a tool, you know, search here, mm -hmm. and it was just kind of a klutzy roll and scroll interface, mm -hmm. but after a while you could build a macro essentially mm -hmm. and look for brittle diabetics and see what they're being described mm -hmm. prescribed mm -hmm. and uh, that's called a class 3 application so there's like 4300 of these out there nowadays 4300 4300 4 class 3 class, applications so a class 3 application is it's kind of like a macro in a spreadsheet okay or, or so, so this is something that a non programmer might write yeah. to that would be based on one of these tools yeah and and report writing is one so yeah. what, what are some other things uh, well, the, the, I, besides I, report writers, well, I'm, I'm trying think, to think of what these would be classifications of these. Uh, yeah, you say class three. Class three is, is I, I don't know exactly the distinction, so sure. forgive me. But class three is your own homebrew uh, activity, and mm -hmm. you might send me the macros to another site, and they could reinstall it. But they're they're responsible for maintaining it. It's like sharing a spreadsheet macro. Mm -hmm. Class two is a little more formal development and uh, uh, somewhat. Professional things. So I, I think the the VA barcoding that, that barcoded the drug, the prescription, the prescription, the patient, and the provider. I think that was a class two application. That okay. saved lives. People people are alive because oh, of that. Absolutely. Today. The bar barcoding is a very yeah. big deal. 
And I think that was a class two, but it was more mm -hmm. formal. Class one is, you know, the uh, laboratory reporting system mm -hmm. and uh, the very extensive uh, system and very elaborate. Okay, so I'm, I'm, but I'm interested in the kind of tools, the tools that you could be a, a non-programmer could use. Yeah. So, so report writing. Is, yeah, report writing is, is one. But depending if you got mumps access, you could write the world inside of your macros if you wanted. It mm -hmm. was one semantic shell. It was like mm -hmm. the shell language, and uh, I that's one of my goals. And I was pretty naive at the time, thinking that you could create the shell that would do all this. But it was it, it wasn't anywhere near as sophisticated as the Unix shell. I never got into Unix until way later. But I was I was big on creating a. Uh, speech community. I was uh, almost went into graduate school on linguistic anthropology and, mm. and how language creates cultures. And so my goal in the VISTA was to create the ability for people to talk. And I saw mm. these hierarchies sure. and stovepipes. Yeah. And I said, how do you, how do you create this, this tool for communicating? You did sort of an email thing, didn't you? An email, yeah. SMTP. I wrote one of the first uh, SMTP processors, mm -hmm. John Postel. And registered VA.gov by calling them up and saying, hey, I'd like VA, and it's okay, you know, that's how I got VA.gov. But um, the whole idea was this, to me, the problem was a failure to communicate, and today, if, looking at the simplicity of design, if we just improved communication, we'd, we'd, we'd bump up 50% well, right well, off the you, bat. You have to have good communication. When you have a large system, the only way you can keep it consistent is if people talk to each other. And, and Which is the first thing the DOD did when they saw the VISTA software. They cut off the intersite communication. They, they said that exceeds requirements, and they, they crippled VISTA, VHCP it was hmm. called at the time, hmm. and said, well, you don't, you, we don't want these to communicate. Hmm. They, they wanted to go up and down the hierarchy, and so all hell broke loose at the, at the leaves of the tree yeah, because they yeah, weren't yeah. communicating. So, so I, I got a good story. So I spent a summer at Bell Labs years ago in the research, and this was a research group up in Chicago which was there because they had a programming group in Chicago of those 3,000 people large, yeah. 3,000 programmers large. And they put a research group there to study them. And I was in someone's, I was just there for the summer, um, and uh, but I was in somebody's office and saw a bunch of, of notebooks on his, up on his shelf. Sure. They were labeled debugging. I said, what? what is that? He said, well, those are notes for a course we made. They asked us to make a course on debugging. That's really interesting. I, I like, know, what, what does it take to be a great debugger? Because, yeah. you know, it's students, it's hard to, to get them to learn to be debugging, so I had to pick up some things. And they told some stories. And the one story I remember was that they had had a, an anthropologist who was working with them. And they decided that, this anthropologist decided that he wanted to study how the uh, how really good debuggers worked. And they did this by doing a survey. They had 3,000 yeah. people. They said, who are the 10 best debuggers that you know? And they, everybody would nominate people. Sure. Well, this guy's a really great debugger. And they, they just took the votes and they found, you know, here's the top, I don't know, 20, 30 people in our organization. People have the most yeah. votes at any rate. And so he would follow them around all day and just write down what they did. Like every five minutes, he would write this down. He had done this before for for his, regular engineers, and yeah. so he had a base mark, yeah. and now he was a, yeah. well, what he discovered, of course, was, that's not too surprising, that pretty much these really great debuggers were, did pretty much the same thing all the other engineers did, yeah. but one interesting thing was, that one thing they did, when they were on the computer working on a hard problem, they were much faster than other engineers at calling someone up on the phone and asking them a question, <laughs> much faster, and, connecting, and the people who they called tended to be on this list of really great debuggers. Uh -huh. So the people who had the reputation of being really great debuggers, they were this social network of the people who had been there a long time, you know, the, the lead sure. designers, the, the yeah. experts, whatever, and they, they knew each other. You know, yeah. There was this, this, this social network. Uh, yeah. They just you used the telephone. To, to yeah. you, this was before <laughs> the days of instant messaging or, yeah, or, yeah. or other thing. Yeah. And, and because this system was big enough, you know, there's no one person who knew how it worked. It required a whole bunch of people yeah. to, to do anything. And if those people couldn't talk to each other, they couldn't solve their design well, problems. Well, that, that was the whole thing, is connecting yeah. people yeah. and building yeah. this yeah. linguistic community, yeah. the speech community. Yeah. So the data dictionary, the meta metadata, the tools for doing that, the email, the, the digital conferencing system, mm -hmm. and the statefulness of the communication. That's a whole mm -hmm. other theme I want to mm -hmm. talk about. 
is state and SQL and the ACID uh, transaction stuff. But the, 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 this idea that a system can be characterized by a single state, you know, and it's, it's like characterizing a cat as a single state. You know, well, it's awake or asleep, but it's, it's a much richer experience than wakeness or sleepness. A toaster you can characterize as a state, you know, it's on or off, broken or whatever. But as soon as you move to a system where the part holds or hold is greater than the sum of the parts, you can't you can't use state that that way. Well, well, I mean, uh, theoretically, everything is a Turing it, machine. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, well. it is a state. It's just it's just your, you know what is it uh, the two to the fortieth states? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's got to be uh, if you've got okay. a, a gigabyte, you know, state, two yeah. to the however many. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a pretty large number of states. Ward, do you want to jump in here? Are we? Kind of you, you know, I uh, uh, my hands are getting tired of holding the video. Okay. So I, I, I think we should wind it up here. I okay. think this has been fantastic. And uh, we got Ralph Johnson, Tom Munnicky. And behind here, this is Ward Cunningham trying to smile. And this has been a spontaneous conversation at the dinner table in Portland, Oregon. And thank you very much, Ward. You've been yeah. a great host. host and, 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 and I want to say... That I know these people, and this could go on for ten <laughs> times this length of time. So, so uh, uh, let, let's just say these are these are, are are problems that for which we know a lot about, but that knowledge is not widely spread. Yep. And spreading that knowledge is probably one of the most important things in front of us going forward. Right. Am I am I right on that? Sure. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Okay. All right. Thank All right, so thank you very much for your attention. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll just do a little sweep here. This is Ward. And, and the empty wine glasses, that was the other problem. I have to, <laughs> I have to admit. Okay. You know, that, that uh, my wife's over there laughing. So, now pour uh, yourself some there, will you too? Tell okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, and uh, thank you, Ralph, and uh, appreciate the conversation. We have a few more uh, bits to waste on this one. Yeah, and, I think uh, so. <laughs> so thanks a lot.